much about himself, so I'm going to tell you some things I know about him. <laughs> Several years ago, <laughs> four other guys used to take off of work one spring day, and we go way up north to Phillips and beyond and play concerts for high school kids. They loved it, we loved it. Well, the part that Ted took in this, he got on the band first. One of the guys had a, a travel home, we carried all the equipment in the trailer behind us, hoping it was still there when we got there, but, oh, I don't know, what does it take to get to Phillips, an hour and a half? Well, then they had three stops there, because there are at least three bars between them. <laughs> well, Ted get, get in the middle of the van. As soon as the van took off, everybody went back to where Ted was. Ted told jokes from the time we got in the van and started from the time we got to Phillips, there are two more places behind and then all the way home. I don't think he even took a breath. <laughs> I started playing tuba with the help of my dear friend Bob Grunetsky, who wrote a scale on a blackboard in the band room at the old Wassa Senior High School. A few months later, the band director stayed late for whatever reason, and he heard me playing the tuba. And he said, well, why don't you join the, the band? So I became a member of the Wassa High School band. And now I'm in the band, and I'm also in the orchestra. So music was pretty important to me at that time. Fifteen years old, I was one year too young to have my first union card. You had to be 16 years of age. But because the lady that owned the band was secretary of the musicians' union, an exception was made so that I could learn how to play properly a dance job. So it was considered training and whatever. I was told that I could not take the school horn to play polka jobs. I enlisted the aid of uh, Art Dornstreich from the VFW, and he gave me the VFW sousaphone to use. That was at the Polar Ballroom east of Anigo on Highway 64. The goodbye sign on the other side of the welcome sign. By the time you're one foot in, you're two feet out. And uh, we had a good crowd. And I got scolded by my dad because he smelled beer on my breath. And he said, you can play as long as you don't drink. If you do that, you, that's the end of it. And of course, this is before I had my own horn and the responsibility of a very expensive instrument and all of that. After that, things seemed to take off. Jerry Gage's tuba player didn't want to play dance jobs, so Jerry asked if I would be his first pay-for-play tuba player. And I left Helen and her merrymakers and went with Jerry Gage's recording orchestra. And I played that for about a year and a half, and then Art says, well, the VFW is now wanting to charge you rent for the horn because you're using it to earn money. And my dad says, I think we're going to buy you a horn, kid. We drove to Duluth, Minnesota. We could not find a horn available in Wausau. And I bought my first tuba in 1948 for $646 on a loan from my father. I made my first recording uh, in Merrill in 1950. So I've been off and on recording with different bands through my career. Out of seven guys in the Jerry Gage band, six were 4F and one wasn't. That was me. So I had to leave the Jerry Gage band 
And I joined the Navy and I played in the Navy band. The only music I played in the Navy was in the recruit band going through boot camp in Great Lakes. Uh, after I got my fleet assignment, I was uh, an aviation ordinance man and a demolition expert. So my time was pretty well occupied. The type of noise I was making was not conducive to musical instruments uh, being a part of it. During that time in the Navy, I was on six different aircraft carriers in and out of the Korean area, the Mediterranean area, and spent a lot of time in Guantanamo Bay, or Gitmo as we call it. There were always members of the Navy band around, so I had access to horns, but there wasn't anybody else that wanted to play polkas at that time. Oh, I missed it terribly. I got out of the Navy in the Philadelphia Navy Yard, and at that time I was freshly married. So living in Trenton, New Jersey. In Trenton, New Jersey, they had a Polish number 59 club where they played polka music. I went down and talked to the band leader, Johnny Stevens. Told him I played tuba, and he said, well, bring your horn down, and we play Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So bring it down Friday night, and we'll audition you and see if you fit in with the band. So I brought the sousaphone down, set it up, and everybody went, ooh, look at the big horn. And, whoa, look at the little guy playing the big horn. It was kind of fun. Everything was played by ear because they didn't have any music for the tuba. Being from Wisconsin and folk as being a part of your life, that's how you played. You didn't always have music. So we got along fine, and they hired me, and that gig lasted five years, three nights a week, at the Polish Falcons number 59 in Trenton, New Jersey. Interspersed with that were the trips to the Hudson Bell, the cruise boat that went up and down the Hudson River and played gigs uh, with Johnny Stevens and with Stanley Reba. Stanley Reba was a member of the Meyer Davis Consortium that provided all the music for the presidents and the White House and whatever. And Stanley had all of the parade jobs in New York City. Stanley said, okay, you've auditioned, you know, and passed that, so I've heard you play before. Uh, we're going to get you fixed up with some uniforms. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're going to need a couple different uniforms. All of them use black pants with orange stripes with white piping, black socks and black shoes. White shirt, black tie. Got that, kid? Yes, sir. And we'll measure you up for your jackets. So on my first trip, we drove with Johnny Stevens and a group, drove up to Newark, New Jersey, went across the river, and uh, now we're going to get on the buses. And there were two buses. One bus had all uniforms in. The other bus had all of us musicians in it. And around our neck, we all had a lavalier with a brass little medallion hanging on it with a number on it. And we were instructed to give it to the guy as we boarded the bus. And he'd say, number 16. That was my number. And he'd give me a hat and a jacket. And it wasn't what I expected, but I put the jacket on. It was orange and with an orange hat with a black brim. And then we went through the parade, and we come back down. And, of course, the guy from the Music Performance Trust Fund, this was all union organized, Sign your name or you don't get paid, kid. So you said, look down here, Ted Gaden Tuba. Sign your name, now you're going to get paid. Well, he said, don't forget to do this the other times. I said, well, what other times? Well, the bus is going to take us back to the beginning of the parade, and you're number 16, so you're going to get a black jacket to wear. <laughs> so we went through the parade four different times with four different guys that were listed as the band leader. Okay, Gino Muley was a leader, and uh, he played baritone horn. And then we had Eddie Zamuda, he was a band leader, and he, play, he was a tuba player. And then we had Frank Coletti, uh, he was a trombone player. And we made a lot of money playing the parades. And Stanley Reba always managed to win first or second place, which was a $250 bonus that was divided between the band members. It generally got about a $10 bill out of the thing by the time we, everything was done. Playing music in New York at the big parades was kind of a nice experience for a little snot-nosed kid from Wausau, Wisconsin, so we had a little fun. 
I was working at Drott Manufacturing. The manager of marketing was a, a Czech fellow by the name of Joe Skornica, who knew that I played Czech and German music. He was quite an ardent fan. He went to Ed Drott and said, well, we have a guy working for us that can put together a ethnic-based band to play for these people from the communist countries that are going to be represented, and they will be escorted by seven KGB individuals that will watch over them and protect them from being contaminated with capitalist ideas. The gig was set for the ski chalet at Rib Mountain, and when we arrived there, I had all of these young men who I had played with different bands with their dads. So these kids were all music students, and some of them were music teachers and were ready to graduate from college. But because it was the University of Wisconsin, they had to be individually investigated and screened, which was upsetting to the parents of those young folks, but it got done. I was the leader of the band, so I was instructed to be very careful that I didn't upset uh, the KGB. The, they were always wearing black long coats for some reason or another. Fine, we get to the job, and two gentlemen from Czechoslovakia came up, and one spoke excellent English, the other one spoke none at all, but his brother would do the translations. And he wanted to know if they could sing together, like they did in their homeland of Czechoslovakia, if they could sing along with the band. And we said, fine what kind of a song would you like to have us play? And they said, the Black Crow Polka, which didn't mean anything to me. I know the song, and it was a, an original Czech orchestration that we had. And he said, you can announce this because all of the other people from Slovakia and the other surrounding areas are familiar with this. Oh, fine. So <laughs> not knowing any better, came time to have the two brothers come up and sing. Now we get to play the song, The Three Black Crows. These two men sang like you can't possibly believe. They have operatic quality voices, perfect lead, perfect harmony. And everyone was just enthralled and listening carefully, except the seven guys from the KGB. They were scowling and they were mad and they were waving their hands and our FBI agents were over there talking to them, and they were getting excited. And like, what the heck's going on here? Well, I still had the music to play, so we finished the song. And the two brothers thanked the band and went and sat down. Two FBI agents and two KGB guys came up and said, after this break takes place, we want to talk to you. And I received the finest ass chewing that I had ever got done so professionally well by uh, a young and an old FBI agent. They had all they could do to keep from laughing because it was humorous that this had happened in Wausau, Wisconsin. And I said, well, what did I do? You played the Czech underground national anthem, you young fool. And I didn't realize that, and this is what Everybody in the crowd loved it, you know. So that was my incident with the KGB and whatever. Two months after the thing was over with, I received a package from the Czechoslovakian brother. And in that package, which had been opened numerous times, were complete orchestrations for 22-piece uh, Czech band, the village bands, which if these men had been caught doing that, I'm sure it would have been very, very serious trouble for both of them. During a difficult time in my life, remembering the good that going into the Navy had done for me as a, as a young adult in helping them to mature and grow, I thought it would be good if maybe you got the heck out of the country put yourself at a complete disadvantage, go to a place you can't even speak the language, you're going to have to learn everything. So an opportunity came, and Drott decided that they could use my talents of troubleshooting and managing a project of building a crane in Brazil. And I was asked if I'd like to go to Brazil to do this, and I said, well, let's do that. So I went to Brazil. Across the street from where I was staying at the Othan Palace in Belo Horizonte, Brazil, 
translated Belo Horizonte as Beautiful Horizons. There was this military band playing, and they were tremendous. So I opened up the window, and I look across, and counted the head count, 22 guys in that military band. And by God, they had a band director with a white coat, white pants, white hat, and a baton, and he is, this outfit is really, really good. So I decided I'd go across the street and listen to him, and I did that. And I got in the back because this, they had four tubers, four sousaphones, and they were con sousaphones like I play. And so I'm looking at this guy, and he's, he's gargantuan sized. My hand's sitting like this, and I'm, I'm going through the fingering of this march that he's playing. And he's watching me. And I'm watching him because none of the 22 guys got any music. And this band director is right there. He's right on the stick. So after the song ended, he motions me over and he takes me up to introduce me to the band leader. The tuba player was noticing you were going through the fingering of this particular march. I said, well, he was, you were playing Alte Kameraden, Old Comrades, a good German march. He says, yes. Do you like German marches? It, <laughs> And I didn't know what to say, and I thought, don't get in trouble. And I said, well, I'm German. He says, you are. What's your name? So I told him. He says, oh, yeah. good, good name, he said, good name. He said, do you want to play a number? And I said, I don't have a horn. And the big guy takes the horn off, and he hangs it on me. He said, now you do, okay. So they took me back, and the band leader announces, you know, to the crowd, that they got this guy, he doesn't know if he can play or not, but you know, he's gonna play. And they asked me, do you, what kind of a march do you think you can play from memory? And I said, well, I can play the Chicago Tribune. And the band leader stopped and he looked at the tuba player and the tuba player says, let him, you know, in Portuguese, let him play that. This is not an easy march, but I had played this in these parades in New York that was one of the standard numbers that we always played with all of the band. We did pretty well and I had a good afternoon. And I don't forget that because I would probably got as soused as I've ever been in my life with 22 guys from Brazil playing, wanting to learn this word, what do you call this, you know, how do you pronounce it and whatever. And, and they're teaching me how to go potty by myself and eat without getting into trouble. It's Romy Gaz's theme song, Have a Drink Polka. Everybody go! Donnie Zamzo was the tuba player for the Jerry Gage Band. And I was the tuba player for the Grand Rose. We had a night off, and Donnie called me. He said, our band is playing at Schmidt's Ballroom, and I'm sicker than a dog, and I can't make it. Can you take my place tonight? I said, Donnie, it's 8 o'clock. When does the job start? He said, 9 o'clock. <laughs> oh, okay. I called Jerry, and they're going to take my horn and set it up on my stand and my chair and my cushion. You've got to bring your own mouthpiece. Go up there, and you're going to ride with Dale Howard. You'll be there, you know, shortly at 9 or shortly after 9 because Dale was never on time in his life. So I get to the job. Well, Romy Gaza's guys are, you know, they started first. They played, but there's the tuba players not sounding like the guy I knew. And his name was Max Terrence, wonderful, wonderful guy, big man. And he motions me over. He said, I'm sick. Can you take my place? I said, Romy Gaza doesn't allow anybody to sit in the band, Max, you know that. He said, well, <clears throat> when you're up there for your set, don't get off the stage. Stay sitting there. And he said, I already told Romy that we're not going to make, I can't make it an hour. So instead of an hour job, it'll only be a half an hour, and you're going to be up there right away. So you, you, when you're up there, you just stay sitting there. What if Romy sees me? He said, well, you're small. You t Sit on the chair, pull your feet up, and the horn is big enough where they won't even see you. Okay, so I did that. The band gets up there, all of Romy Gaza's guys now climb on the stage. 
Billy looked at me, and he's kind of grinning because he knew that Max was sick. Billy Mertz and Luger Carmen were the two reed men, sax and clarinet. They doubled on instruments. And Sweet Pea was the piano player. Steber was the drummer. They had a nickname for him, too, because of his big feet. And then, of course, Romy Gauz, and uh, I forget who was playing second trumpet that night. They get on a stage, and Romy gets up on the stage, picks up his horn, wiggles the elves a little bit, looks around, yeah, there's a head there, a head there, a head there, turns around and look, yep, there's feet hanging down, there's a tuba player, so didn't pay any attention. I didn't realize that he never announced anything, uh, polka, waltz, uh, what key, uh, the name of anything, and I'm scared like you can't believe. And he says, ah, what do we leave off with? And Carmen says, well, a polka is supposed to be up, Romy. So now we're going to play a polka. Oh, thank God, I know it's going to be a polka. And he, boom, boom, taps off in the third beat, you're playing, see? So on the third beat, the name of the polka, I'll never forget it, the Sylvia polka, and I knew it well. It was one of the first polkas I ever learned how to play, and it was recorded by Romy Gauss. So we get through this first polka, and everybody in the band is looking and shaking their head because I played, my style and Max's style were pretty close together. So Romy never knew that anything was any different. The guys in the band did because they could see me. Six or seven sets later, he still don't know. <laughs> Sweet Pea is laughing so hard you could see the dried little white streaks on his... It was really funny to watch this, but it was kind of gratifying and exciting for me because, hey, I'm playing big time here. You know, this, this is the best polka band in the country. The polka king, Romy Gauz. Now the set changed, so I keep, just keep sitting there, okay? Romy gets off the stage, and here's Max sitting at the first, <laughs> first bench. <laughs> and Romy stops, turns around and looks. The guy is still up there. Looks at Max, and then Max tells him that, you know, he was sick and that I it was okay, and I did okay, and he should leave me alone and not be too hard. So Romy got back up on the stage, and I watched the top of his head come around the bell. <laughs> and he was staring at me right in the eyeballs. And he say, do you think you can play a four-hour gig sometime, kid? And that was the end of the conversation. I'm interested in helping someone grow, either musically or whatever their job structure may be. I was hired through Butterfield Employment Agency and a very wealthy business owner, the father. His son was my boss, but the father said, I'm hiring you, and I'm the only one that can fire you. My second day on the job, the boy took me out in the plant and said, see that guy over there? Yeah. I want him fired. And I said, What's he doing other than standing there? He said, that's just exactly why I want you to fire him. Look at him. He doesn't represent what I feel I want the public to see as an employee of any business I run. I don't know, okay. His name was Charlie. Charlie was illiterate. He could not read or write. He did not drive a car. So I got his foreman, and I said, yeah, he says, I know. Everybody in the plant was watching you. I did a little research on you. You're a pretty tough, hard-nosed, troubleshooting type of guy. So you know what you're dealing with here with Charlie Hire, don't you? And I said, he's the sick puppy. Never hurt the sick puppy, right? Tell me about Charlie. He said, well, he's worked here 12 years. He's never missed a day of work or ever been late. I said, why does anybody want to fire a guy like that? That's a gold mine of an employee. He said, well, your, your boss is a spoiled brat with a lot of money. And daddy's got you in here to take care of a job he don't want to do. So you use your best judgment. And I said, well, is there anything that he does that's wrong? Every other Thursday, he takes off for two hours. And then he comes back and he works without punching in the two hours to make up for what he was missing. I said, well, how the hell does he get a ride home? He hitchhikes. 
In 12 years, he's hitchhiked to and from work. Oh, yeah. The state troopers pick him up all the time, especially in bad weather. They, everybody knows Charlie. Not everybody, do they? I went down to the cab company and tried to get them to tell me, you know, we're, we're not going to tell you nothing. You want to find out? Ride with Charlie. I said, well, Charlie won't allow that. You know, it's very secretive. So I followed Charlie. He went to the blood bank. He was giving blood, and everybody had their day of picking on Charlie because he couldn't read or write. So I took Charlie aside, and I said, Charlie, we're going to have an employee meeting next Tuesday, and I would like very much if you would be standing right in the front, and I want to have you come up and stand alongside of me when I'm talking. Would you do that? Well, he said, I'll do it, but I'm not going to like it. So we had the big meeting, and I said, ladies and gentlemen, all 252 of you, this meeting is going to have to cover the good, the bad, and when is it going to happen? Right now we're a three-shift operation. Effective tonight when you go home, we're going to be a two-shift operation. And everybody moaned, what about the third shift operation? They're going to be all given jobs on the first shift or the second shift. Nobody here is a bat. You don't fly and eat at night like a bat. So we're going to have daylight for everybody at some time that's convenient for us all. But everyone will have a job. And I want you to meet my new friend, Charlie Hire. How many of you are married? A lot of them raised their hands. And I said, OK. How many of you have had sicknesses in your family where you've had to have blood? Same amount of hand. Well, my friend Charlie has given over 47 gallons of his blood in the 12 years that he's worked here. Nobody picked on Charlie anymore. It was about two years later, and Natalie comes downstairs, and a funny look on her face. She hands me this Christmas card. It was right at the Christmas season, and she says, go up in the bedroom and open this yourself. I looked at the handwriting on that thing. My God, it was terrible. But it was postmarked Ocala, Florida. Must be somebody I know, right? So I went up there, and I tell you, the three most important words of my life were about ready to be presented to me at that time. I opened up the Christmas card. Three words. Ted, thanks, Charlie. It's amazing that the good Lord let me have the self-satisfaction of helping someone. And I have to tell you, I really like that feeling. We owned a liquor store, and we advertised for some help. And I was at home cleaning up some stuff prior to going to the shop, and the phone rang, it's Natalie, my wife. Get your hinder down here right now. There's a person looking for this, filling this position we've advertised in the paper. And I'm scared. He's an ex-convict. Get down here right now. So whew, I beat it down there. I open up the door, and I'm looking at the guy. And I'm looking at one of the toughest people that through years of fighting, you had a way to size up your opponent. And I looked at that person, and I said, hey, that is a real man. I walked over, I said, what's your name? He said, Steve. He stuck out his hand, and I shook his hand. Good grip. Mr. Gaden, I need a job. I need a break. I'm an ex-convict. I've been all over the city of Duluth. No one wants to hire me because of my age and because of my incarceration in a federal penitentiary. What can you do? He says, I can do anything. I'm good with my hands. And I've got one thing to tell you. If you're my boss, I take care of you. That lady is your wife, I take care of her. I said, okay, Steve, be to work at five minutes to eight tomorrow morning. Why five minutes? Because your day starts at eight o'clock, but if you aren't here by five minutes to eight, you're late. That's called Ted's time, got that? He says, oh yeah, I'll remember that. Six months later, the guy was our assistant manager. We never had any problem. This man was street smart, he just loved Natalie, he loved our dog Margaret, our basset hound. He seemed to interface with me pretty well, so we had a good thing going for us. 
now comes the time when, as it will with every good employee, that they have to move on for whatever reason. It just happens. Natalie called me and she says, Steve is here, he wants it's his day off, but he came in and he wants to talk to you. He's already talked to me. Please, honey, come on down. I walked in and I said, okay, Steve, what kind of a job did you get? Well, he said, it's a dandy. He said, Ted, the money is so tremendous. I, you know, being a family man, I got, I got to think about it. I said, fine. What did you tell your prospective boss? Well, he said, I told him it, you wanted at least a month notification before I could start. And I said, well, is that right? A month, huh? Oh, okay. Is this guy that you're going to work for, is he going to, is he going to treat you okay? Is he going to treat you as well as Natalie and I treated you? Oh, oh, yeah. He knows about you, and he expects you to call him. I said, I'll take care of that right away. I got the guy on the phone, and I said, I'm Ted. Steve here, he's just told me he wants to leave and start to work for you. All I want to hear from you is how you're going to treat him. I don't care what you're going to pay him. Pay is only one part of his job, it's one part of his life. Are you going to treat him as well as my wife and I have treated him? Are you going to see that he learns and prospers and grows? And a guy said, you're every bit the man that I thought you would be, Ted. You betcha. I said, how bad do you need him? He said, Ted, I could use him tomorrow morning. <laughs> I said, okay. Steve has just given me two days' notice, and I've accepted it. Is that satisfactory? He said, God love you, Bob. Life changed. Now I'm back in Wassa, and I own this instrument repair business, and I thought it'd be nice if I had my old horn. I really missed that horn. I made a lot of money with it. And I traced it to a guy in Texas. And I called the guy up on the phone, and I said, do you have a 20K Sousa phone? Yeah. He said, how'd you know that? I said, well, I was given your name from Willard Canise. Yeah, he said, I bought the horn from Willard Canise. Why, do you want to buy it? I said, yeah, what do you want? He said, $400. I'll pay the shipping. Sold. So I bought my original horn back, <laughs> and we ran it through the shop. And I have to admit, the horn today is better than the day that I bought it. We completely reconditioned the horn and rebuilt everything. The valves were done just absolutely perfect. Better than factory new. I'm quite low on tubers right now. I think I only own five tubers now, which is the, about a half a basement full. <laughs> the horn, irrespective of what you want to call it, trumpet, cornet, sax, clarinet, whatever, is something that enables a musician to present how he feels to somebody else. So it's extremely important to get that instrument back to him as good as it was when you got it, or better. And it's a challenge because musicians sometimes are forgetful. And they put it on a stand, not quite properly well, okay, and they walk by it and they kick it over. And voila, we now have a visit to band instrument repair to pound a dent out. And because it's my baby, I want it to be as good as it was or better than it was when I give it to you to fix. I guess music is love without words, a beautiful way to communicate that we here in our country haven't learned to fully appreciate. It's the discipline and the belief and the inner satisfaction that you get from playing a musical instrument that'll make a better person of you. It'll help you stay on target, on goal. Playing the tuba became really, really interesting to me because of the precision in German music, but with the background of the, the drummer, the tuba player and the, the baritones. How they interfaced together was really always so beautiful to me. I just loved it. So I thought I would try to be a good tuba player. And that's why I work at it. Sometimes I'm successful and other times, well, what are you gonna do? Dixieland is, is and polkas are my, my, my love for tuba music. Dixieland music is the root music of the United States of America.
again, it's, it's a way in which people live, love, and get together. I don't know if there's ever any words that can ever describe the satisfaction and feeling of playing music that makes people happy, that makes people want to get along with one another, just play and have a good time. Each type of music is the requiring certain things that have to be done by the musician in order to have the music keep its identity. What kind of polka do you want to hear? Do you want to hear a Polish polka, which is different than a Czech polka, which is different than a German polka, which is different than a Slovenian polka? And each one of these types of Slovenians, you're going to have an accordion or a button box, okay, uh, or a concertina playing the lead parts and the harmony parts and whatever else. The Czech music is probably the most sophisticated because it's a combination of the German and the Czech. It's not kind of a standalone type of thing. So it's absolute precision. I have a band called Veselka that we sell through Polka Productions. And you'd think there's 20 guys in the band. There's only 10. But my God, these guys are symphony quality musicians. So when they play, it's unbelievably very melodic, very, very pretty. And it doesn't sound like, this is a polka? But that's the difference between a Czech and now that comes the German. The German polka is every bit as melodic, but it's not quite as precise regarding the dynamics and the type of voicing in the uh, orchestration. The German tuba player is good. The Czech tuba player is fantastic. You're getting a polka education. And now we come to the Polish polka. Get out of the way with the horns. All I need is an accordion, <laughs> okay? And a drummer, okay? And a piano. Polka Land Records was started about 45, 50 years ago. We bought the business from Greg Leiter, which came with all of the rights to produce, reproduce, all of the Romy Gaz recordings, the Lawrence Duco recordings, the Dick Rogers, the, the, the bigger and better bands. There's no replacement coming up to take their place. So now we have to have the records do the job, the tapes, the CDs, etc. And that's what Polka Land Records is. It is a repertoire to be on deposit, so that if I want to hear what uh, Jerry Mosnick, who the hell was he? Well, he was a Czech band from Ohio somewhere, or Indiana someplace. Oh yeah, what'd he sound like? Well, why don't you get a hold of Polkaland? They got some Jerry Mosnick recordings. Well, thank you. And you know, that's the wonderful thing about music. There's something for everyone with music. It's up to the individual to do the searching and find it. We're going to make a little documentary or something like that. And so I get here tonight and, yeah, Brian's here. Ted's here. John's here. <laughs> what the hell's he doing? Peterson is here. What the hell's going on? You know, I don't have a budget for this. <laughs> anyway, Ted, put it here. Great show. <laughs> My wife is over being angry with me. With the last couple of years were kind of touchy because she claimed that I had bribed the doctor to prescribe in a prescription, on a prescription document, that Ted is to play his tuba 45 minutes every day. <laughs> So finally, I said, you're only one way to settle this. Why don't you call up Dr. Mark Ruschetto and take this up with him? But I said, I, I just ask one favor. I want to be sitting across the table when you make that phone call. So 
so she says, well, let's do it right now. <laughs> and of course, she's uh, a woman of strong mental strength, smarter than I am, certainly. And she got Mark on the phone. And it was the shortest, most beautiful, one-way conversation <laughs> I've ever had. In my life. All she did was, oh, yes. Oh, is that right? Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, certainly. Uh, yes, thank you, doctor. Bang. That was the end of the conversation. Mark had all he could do to keep from winning his pants and laughing so hard on the other end because I told him that this probably was going to take place. <laughs> it pays to be friendly with your doctor, especially if he's the guy with the knife and you're the one that's asleep. 